Tonight's Bible reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verses 16 to chapter 5, verse 10. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who made us for this very purpose and has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. This is God's word. Well, keep your Bibles open at that passage, which we're going to look at now. Um, I might pray before we begin. Father, we thank you that you are a God who has revealed yourself in your words so that we can know you. We pray that we will know you better as a result of reading your word and hearing it and thinking through it, that you will continue to teach us so that we might be transformed more and more into the image of your Son. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today I want to ask you a question about mottos. What mottos do you know? Now, while you uh, spend a moment thinking about that, let me give you my loose definition of a motto. It's a sort of a short or a succinct set of words that sums up an ideal or a belief uh, by which you endeavour to live by. Now, one motto that probably readily came to mind was that of the Scouts, the Boy Scouts be prepared. It's probably one of the well-known mottos. The founder uh, of the Boy Scouts, Robert Baden-Powell, was a military man. He came up with that motto in the earliest 20th century and he was asked, what, does it, what do you need to be prepared for? Which he said, anything. He wrote that it meant always being in a state of readiness in mind and body to do your duty. He wanted to see young men equipped and ready to react in any emergency. Now, the US Coast Guard also adopted a very similar motto, uh, but theirs, theirs came first. It was in Latin, uh, and I think Latin is always used to give it that gravitas that <laughs> something in English doesn't have. Uh, their motto is Semper Paratus, which means always ready. Um, now, once you start thinking about mottos, there are a lot of things that come to mind, aren't there? from the slick uh, Nike, uh, Nike slogan, just do it, uh, which sort of became a lot of, for a lot of people, a motto of how they live their lives. Uh, but when you look at that motto a little bit more, the inspiration for that motto was reportedly a convict, a convicted murderer who was executed, who said to his executioners, let's do it. Um, then you have that wisdom from Disney and a fish called Dory just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Now, there isn't a list of mottos in scripture, but there are a number of places where you do find a short, pithy statement or phrase with a few well-chosen words that sums up exactly how we ought to be living. And tonight, I wanted to look with you at some of those well-chosen words that the Apostle Paul penned in his second letter to the Corinthians that were read, was read out Tonight, particularly, we're just looking at those words, we live by faith, not by sight. Or if you've got a, a Christian standard Bible, it says, 
We walk by faith, not by sight. The word to live is that word to walk in the Greek and it's used several times by the Apostle Paul in this figurative sense of this is the way we are to live or to walk in life. Here the Apostle reminds the believers of how we are to live as those who will one day stand before our our Saviour and be answerable to him as when he appears. Now, to better understand what Paul meant by walking by faith, not by sight, what we need to do is to uh, have a better look at the context in which these words are found and why they appear there. Now, as we heard from chapter 4 and verse 16, the Apostle has been explaining to the Corinthians why he and his other workers didn't lose heart despite the hardship that they were going through, despite the suffering that they were going through, the trouble that they'd already been through and were continuing to endure for the sake of the ministry of the gospel. Now, if you think about that suffering, um, he wrote at the start of the letter uh, that he didn't want the Corinthians to be uninformed about the troubles that they'd been through when he went through some troubles in Asia. Let me read out uh, chapter 1, verse 8 to 9. If you've got your Bibles, that would be great to, to follow along. He says, We were under great pressure so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. Now, the apostles' troubles were many indeed. And if you want to have a longer Uh, have a look at a longer list of them, you can turn to chapter 11 where he lists them out. Um, He wrote in chapter 4 and verse 8 and 9 that they were hard-pressed on every side. He says, but we weren't crushed. He says, we were perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. But despite all these things going on in his life, all these hardships, all this suffering he can say, we do not lose heart. And in these verses, he's explaining why. He wrote that outwardly we are wasting away, but inwardly we are being renewed day by day. One of the things that was happening was God was working in him through the Spirit, renewing him in the image of God's Son. But he also talks about what he does. And he he mentions fixing his eyes, not on what is seen but what is unseen have a look at verse 18 of chapter 4 so we fix our eyes not on what is seen but what is unseen since what is seen is temporary but what is unseen is eternal now this is the only reason Paul can really consider the his troubles light and momentary because he has his eyes fixed not on what he just sees about him but on the unseen things His focus was on the eternal things, the things that are not visible right now that you can see, but which God had told him about, had promised him, rather than the temporary things that are around us in this world. But what are these unseen things that the apostle had fixed his eyes upon? Well, the things that he knew and was convinced about are the things he believed that had been revealed to him through the word of God. They were the things that he knew to be true and he'd put his confidence in them and then started living on the basis of those things. Now, several of these truths are actually scattered through chapters 4 and 5. Walking by faith uh, doesn't mean, uh, and not by sight, doesn't mean that we sort of grope around in the darkness, feeling our way like kids who are playing Marco Polo in the pool, waiting for a voice to appear out of nowhere and suddenly tell them which direction to go into. Uh, We are not waiting for some supernatural uh, voice to come from heaven to tell us where next to go or what to watch out for in life. Nor are we sort of flying blind as, as though we've been blindfolded and just have to go our merry way. God has given us his words and his great and precious promises in the gospel that we are to base our lives on and then walk by faith in those things that we know to be true. He's told us how things really are. It's as though we see the world, but we don't see everything. And he's revealed his purposes and his plan, the unseen things. We are to live according to those things that he's told us in his word, which 
we are meant to know ourselves, understand, and we're meant to believe and act upon. And Paul in these verses tells us what he knew and he believed and what that meant for him for how he lived his life. Now, we're going to look at a few of these, and there are at least three things that I want to point out that Paul knew and believed and that shaped his life and is to shape our lives as well. When talking about knowing and believing these things, Paul often uses the first person plural, we or us, because these things are things that we're all meant to know and believe and to base our lives on. The first thing that he knew and believed is that the glory to come will far outweigh the troubles and suffering that we experience now in this world for the sake of the gospel. Uh, Have a look at verse 17 where he says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Now that's something that you don't see, you can't see, because it's future. Uh, But we know it to be true and we are to believe it so that we don't lose heart. And Paul had been hard-pressed, he says. He'd been crushed. He'd been persecuted. He'd been struck down. In Asia, he said, it came to the point where he even despaired of life itself. And Paul could only say these things were light and momentary troubles because he knew and believed that the eternal glory that awaited him far outweighed all his troubles and suffering. Now, this is something we have to have in our perspective. The glory to come far outweighs anything this world might give us or any loss that it might impart because we belong to Jesus. The Apostle Paul kept speaking and sharing the gospel for the sake of the Corinthians and for the sake of other Gentile believers, uh, sharing the gospel despite all the things that he had to endure because he knew and believed that Christ had been raised from the dead and because he raised, because Christ had been raised, he would be raised from the dead and he would share in his glory. So in one sense, it's about perspective that you're to have in life and these things you know and believe are to give you the perspective so that you can live your life in a way that pleases God uh, and makes sense of the present. See, the glory to come, he says, far outweighs any glory that this world offers and even makes the troubles and experiences now, experiences we go through now seem light and momentary in comparison. The world and what it might appear to offer us can't compare, can't compare to what is ours in Christ Jesus. And it, and it is worthwhile putting careers on hold or, or not accepting a promotion so that you have more time to do other things like uh, teaching the word of God to kids on a Sunday, being a Sunday school teacher or being, being helping out with a, a Bible study group or spending time helping those in need. All those things that you might think, I don't have time for, well, eternity puts them into perspective when you realise that the glory is the come and not now. Even the heartache and the suffering that might come to believers on account of the gospel can't compare with that glory that will one day be ours when we stand in front of Jesus to see him face to face. That changes the way you live now. It's that future perspective that changes the present reality for us. Well, the second thing that the apostle knew and believed is that we have permanent, eternal, heavenly bodies awaiting us in heaven. And that's what Paul is referring to in the first five verses of chapter 5. Let me read those out for you. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Because we, when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Now we all know our bodies perish over time, and when you're young, you actually think that you have forever. You know, that, that it's going to take a long time to get to the age that, you know, your grandparents are at. I remember looking at my grandmother thinking, how, 
how could you ever live that long that you look like so, so weather beaten uh, and uh, with so many spots on your hands? And, you know, she, you know I looked, looked at her and think, it's going to take forever for me to get to that age. But, with, but those, uh, so those years pass very quickly. And even if you get to live the 85 years, which is the current life expectancy for someone born today, it all goes very quickly. Paul brings out the temporary nature of our bodies by describing it as a tent. And Paul knew tents because he was a tent maker. You know, the thing about tents is they just don't last. Uh, we were a family who, uh, my kids are grown up now, but when they were young, every year in January we would take our holidays like a lot of ministers do uh, for a couple of weeks in January. We'd go camping for two weeks, which was a big thing to do if you've got kids to, to get ready to go camping. We would spend two weeks of the summer holidays under tarp and over the years that we did this, we went through three tents and many tarps because they would all wear out. Uh, the zipper would go on them and they would get a hole in them and they'd begin to leak, especially around the seam where they used to leak. And we'd try to repair them at first, but in the end, you just had to replace them. And that's what Paul's saying our bodies are like. You can only fix them up for so long. They grow old, they wear out, they get damaged. They don't last and eventually you'll surrender them to the grave. But Paul wrote that we know that our earthly tent we live in is destroyed. And he's talking about our bodies here. Uh, he, he's saying when it's destroyed, we have this building, not built by human hands, but built by God through the work of Christ, a resurrection body a body that's made to last. And this building isn't a temporary one because it's going to be swallowed up by life itself. Paul had already told the Corinthians this in his first letter. He wrote back in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 53, he says, the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and mortal with immortality. And it's what they should have known in one sense. It's what we all know in one sense. And it's meant to change the way that we think about spending our lives now. Paul could say he could happily spend his life for the sake of others because he knew that he'd never lose his life. And that's the way that we're to think. We can be spent up for the Lord in the way that we use our lives knowing that we have this resurrection body, knowing that the glory is to come. It's what the Apostle knew and believed and it's what he expected us to believe. What we have here now is all temporary. It doesn't take very long before you realise that. You know, as often I, having been in the same place for 30 years, I'd see people transition through life. You know, when I first arrived there at Chatswood, I would see people and they were in their family home. They would then have this lovely family home on the North Shore and the next step was a unit. We're downsizing. And all their possessions, which they had many of, would end up usually on the street because no one wanted them in the family. Or they'd give them to the pastor. Uh, Do you want this bed? Uh, uh, not really, but I'll take it off your heads. But, uh, and, and then from there, it, it would go from the two-bedroom place to somewhere like a hostel. And then all their earthly possessions would be found eventually, if they went to a nursing home, eventually alongside their bed in a little wardrobe. Everything perishes, everything passes away. And we are to use what we have now for the sake of the kingdom. Because one day it will all be gone. One day you'll trade your nice family home if you've got it. Maybe the young people will never have it but uh, here in Sydney because it's so costly. But it, it is, is once, one day you'll trade that family home and it will, it will be gone. And all your possessions will be gone. And you won't even be able to give them to your grandchildren or your children because they won't want them. But what we have is something far better. You know, it doesn't matter how much you work out or how, how well you eat or uh, exercise. I still play soccer at 60, but 
you know, it's not going to save me in the end. We all have this invisible use-by date stamped on us that has always been there from the very beginning. It is what is to come that makes what we might endure now for the sake of Jesus light and momentary. It is the assurance of the life to come that gives meaning to the, the hardship and the suffering that we might experience now for the sake of the gospel. And it's also what ought to galvanise us into action, to live a life worthy of that gospel that we've received. Well, the last thing that the apostle knew and believed was that when that day came and the time came for this life to be over, he would finally be at home with the Lord. That's how he describes it, home with the Lord. I've been on holidays, I came home, and of course one of the things I had to do when I got back was a funeral for one of the members who passed away. And we talked about home a lot, that idea of home with the Lord. That's, that's what happens for us as believers. We depart and go home to be with the Lord. Uh, for chapter 5, verse 8, he says, We are confident, and I say, would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. In verse 6, he wrote that he knew that so long as he remained at home in the body, they were away from the Lord. They, he doesn't see the Lord face to face like he one day will. And these bodies are not able to be at home with their Lord. They're just not made that way. But when this life is over, we go home to be with the Lord. We, we no longer see him just through the eyes of faith, faith, but we see him face to face then. Therefore, the apostle says that he would prefer to be away from the body. To be away from the body is to be home with the Lord because he knew that he would receive that imperishable body and have no life forever with the Lord. He wrote to the Philippians that to depart and be white with Christ is better by far. This is one of the other things he believed and he knew to be true and he lived out that truth. The glory to the come far outweighs any trouble or hardship or any glory or honour that you might have now. We'll have this eternal, permanent, heavenly body and finally we'll be at home, the true home that we've always been aching for, longing for. And he talks about that, doesn't he, in the way that he talks about, you know, in the, that the, while we're in this body we long for and we groan. Uh, it's like being in a tent. After about 10 days you start to long for and groan for to be in your permanent home and not in the tent anymore. And, and that's what he's saying about our bodies. We, 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 we get to that point where we long for and groan to be at home with the Lord in our new heavenly bodies. See, the fear of suffering and death could have stymied the work of the gospel, but it didn't. It didn't because the Apostle Paul and others like him walked by faith and not by sight. They trusted in what God had revealed to them in the gospel and lived by faith in those things rather than what they saw. This is how we are meant to leave, live. He's used that language of what we know, what we believe. These are things that if you're a Christian, you know and believe and are meant to, meant to impact the way that you live now. You're to live by faith and not by sight. But when it comes to what does that look like, well, Paul describes that in verses 9 to 10. Look at those verses with me where he describes what it means to walk by faith and the goal of those who do. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we're at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for him, what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. See, he says, if you have that perspective of living by faith and not by sight, then your goal is to please the one who you serve and will one day stand before on that day of judgment, before the judgment seat of Christ, he writes. And Paul makes it clear that this was not just his goal, but to be the goal of every believer. This is the goal that you go away with today, tonight. You're going to go into this week and if your goal is, if, if your desire 
is to please the Lord, then you'll live by faith and not by sight. You'll put into practice the things that you know to be true, that you know through the scripture, and you'll live them out. And he thinks it's the goal for every believer. For we, he says, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. As believers, of course, we've been forgiven and saved and won't face God's wrath and judgment on that day because of Christ's sacrifice for us. But there are plenty of places in scripture where we're told we'll appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of our stewardship as his servants. And as his servants, how we're to live now? Well, we're always to seek to please him. See, Paul told the Ephesians that they were to live as children of light. And in chapter 5, verse 10, he then said to them, find out what pleases the Lord. It's no excuse to say, I didn't know what pleases the Lord. He, he gives them that command. Find out what the Lord's will is and do those things that please him. Now, that's what we're called to be doing. We are to turn to the word of God, find out what pleases the Lord, and, and as suggested earlier, those things will be the way that you behave at work, the way that you conduct your life, the values that you live for. Uh, and you're to walk by faith, knowing and believing that the glory that's coming far outweighs anything you might experience in this world. We are to live here knowing that one day we'll appear before him. And the other thing is you don't walk by sight. What you see going around in the world around you, what they seem to value is not what you have to value. We see people who look for honour and glory, you know, to, to be that man at work or that woman, uh, because they believe that this world is all there is. That's what they believe, all there is. And what they have now is all that they'll ha ever have to enjoy. But you're not like that. You know that the glory that you will share will go on for eternity because you're sharing his glory. That is not what we believe. We believe that we will be raised to life and one day we'll stand before his judgment seat and all that will matter to us on that day will be whether we walk by faith and live to please him. In, no, in, in whatever we, we are doing in life, whether it be at our working place or whether it be part of your community here as, uh, as a church community, whether you are living such a way to reflect Christ and please him in the way that you lived. You do that by living according to what you know and believe rather than what you see. So as Paul says, we're to fix our eyes on the unseen things, the things that are eternal, these are the things that God has promised us in the gospel that are not yet visible, but one day we will see them. We're to fix our eyes on the truth that we've received and believe and let them be the guide to our feet. Let them light the way so that we might live a life that pleases the Lord. Friends, let us walk by faith, not by sight.